Hello and welcome to News Click. The second phase of the Bihar elections is scheduled to be held on November 3rd. Now, these elections are important not only for the state of Bihar but also for the country. A lot of key issues at stake. And one of the key aspects of Chief Minister Nitish Kumar's campaign has been his claim of good governance. He said that over the past 15 years, he's brought about a lot of economic change to the state, brought, a lot of, a lot about, lot, brought about a lot of administrative change to the state. But how much of this has really happened? To talk more about this, we have with us Praveen Jha, Professor of Economics at Jawaharlal Nehru University. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so my first question was regarding a very curious phenomenon as far as Bihar's finances are concerned. Now, it looks like Bihar actually has a revenue surplus and you would, when we talk, states are talking about having no money for development, no money to spend. But how does a state like Bihar actually end up with a revenue surplus and what does it indicate about the government spending? Two things. You see, you have to contextualize it and situate it in the larger trajectory of center state finances and in particular the neoliberal turn which was manifested largely through FRBM Act which then tied whatever states get from center by keeping their fiscal deficits, in particular revenue deficit, the idea was to do away with revenue deficit and fiscal deficit could have been in the range of around 3% or so. So that was the larger sort of context and uh, it is basically around 2000 or so that this thinking got into action, 3-4 was the period when it gets implemented. So basically from 4-5 onwards, you will notice that a large number of very poor states in India, they get into this business of revenue surplus, right? whether it is Orissa, Bihar, you know, whichever state you are looking at, the so-called Bimaru states, it's a phenomena which is um, there and it seems a bit odd, a bit bizarre, a, you know, somewhat as you said curious and so on. But it's fully understandable. Yeah. Now there are only two ways that uh, you will have uh, revenue surplus. One, you actually raise more resources. Now clearly that is not happening on any significant scale. In case of Bihar in particular, in fact the larger part of what Bihar gets as resources or uh, gets in its resource kitty as resources comes from the centre. Right. So, the state in any case does not have too many things from which it can raise resources. Now, the share of direct taxes is very small and so on in case of Bihar. So, you essentially then think of ways by which you curtail the expenditure. Right. So, essentially that has been happening. If you look at the long term trend for about roughly 15, 16 years, in almost each one of these states, right? which then basically means very key areas which should receive attention as part of the development trajectory get neglected and in particular social sector. Right? I mean, I'll give you one example, for instance. Now, if you look at uh, uh, the situation in Bihar with respect to, let's say, what is supposed to be a requirement at uh, the health centers, primary health center, local hospitals, and so on and so forth. So, per community health center, the required number of specialists is supposed to be Four. Now that in itself may be on the lower side because the number of health centers that you have is not adequate and the reach is, uh, if anything, has worsened over the years. But if we take this as the state's stated requirement, then as per the most recent estimate from the official stats, the position occupied is 121. Vacancy is 483. Now, you know, it is obviously a grotesque kind of situation, right? And I am giving you only one example relating to the health sector. 
we can get into the nitty gritty of it, we can get into education and so on, we can look at the requirements that we have of trained teachers, etc. So, if you look at the overall priorities of the state government, somewhere it is to keep your expenses in a functional state by addressing the most urgent needs. What are the most urgent needs then? Salaries. I mean, you can't run a government without doing that. And that too you know, is of a nature where there are lots of questions being asked. So, for instance, if you look at the workers on the ground, the most critical workers, you know, Anganwadi workers, your so Ashas and so on, or look at uh, teachers, what has been done in case of Bihar is basically you have the overwhelming cadre of para teachers. Right? So, through that also you compress the overall expenditure. Right? So, basically this has been the situation right? over the last almost three decades, has different phases and so on. In case of Bihar, 2004-05 onwards i mean it was already uh, you know in in 4 5 the revenue surplus was 1076 crores and uh, in the last uh, uh, fiscal it was 19173 crores right uh, what happens in case of bihar and most people probably do not pay adequate attention to it is uh, that there was a massive expansion for about roughly 10 years of uh, resources through alcohol. Yeah. So, there was a very, very indiscriminate spread of uh, outlets, most of these so called tekas, uh, villages, etc. And then it became a huge problem. Yeah. So, village after village started complaining and so on. So, <clears throat> earlier with respect to alcohol you had a more careful strategy you know you did not have this kind of indiscriminate expansion etc. What happens then? You decide to have a basically 180 degrees right. You go to the other extreme what has happened on the ground? Essentially the state has been criminalized. So, it is not the case that alcohol is not available easily in Bihar. You know, as had happened in Gujarat earlier, the other prohibition states and so on. So, it is widespread availability, which is of course, a cause of concern. But equally importantly, youth of Bihar, they find that a very, very easy option to get into because there is no employment, right. So, it is a kind of employment which the state effectively has put in the category of criminalized employment. So, you have to look at this particular aspect, how Bihar's resources grew and it did grow for a while, you know, its own resources and so on, uh, up to 15, 16 or so. But after that, I mean, if you again uh, look at uh, some numbers as regards uh, own resources, you know, last four years or so, the situation has been uh, pretty grim. So, that is the kind of uh, uh, context which we need to keep in mind. But I took some time explaining this, simple answer is that the claims are highly exaggerated of addressing issues of development and doing various things and so on. Bihar continues to have the lowest per capita income amongst all Indian states. Yes, indeed, if growth figures have to be believed and uh, I have had serious reservations about growth figures, not only for Bihar, but uh, almost 
Pan India last five six years in particular. But uh, during the decade of uh, 2010, we did not have enough information to calculate growth rate of agriculture. Right? No, for a while you did not have the requisite information in economic survey. If that is the case, then of course we can sort of be excused for being more cynical for Bihar's growth figures. But even if you take those growth figures as they are, and uh, they have been higher than the average all India and one of the you know higher uh, GDP state GDP growth rates and so on. Uh, yet, as we mentioned before, uh, we are talking of the lowest per capita income. Right? If you look at various indicators, you know whether it has to do with health, education, employment, unemployment. You know, the last uh, uh, data that we had from uh, PLFS, you know, which showed that India had the highest unemployment rate in its 45 years for which we had the comparable data, right? And uh, in that, Bihar's share, Bihar's percentage was higher than the national average. So clearly, if growth is happening, why is it, it not translating into hmm, certain kinds of options which uh, will generate livelihoods, employment and so on, right? So basically, my sense is that uh, to the extent that this spending or the expenditure <coughs> has to happen, these happen on areas which are very critical areas. For instance, you have to repay your loans. I mean, you can't uh, get away from that. You have to pay salaries and so on and so forth. Right? But real good quality expenditure for expansion of the economy. That, unfortunately, is not happening. So, there is no puzzle. You know, there is no curiosity, why is it that? So, partly, it is driven by the centre, what the centre insists and so on. And uh, partly, it is a kind of uh, choice that a poor state has to make. So, in this context, I just will come to the COVID aspect as well. But I wanted to ask one more question regarding the state's overall debt. And one of the figures that has come out in recent times is that there has been a huge increase in the amount of debt that is sustained. Now, one would understand it if it's, for instance, a state which is in, say, peak economic development, there's a lot of uh, industrial growth, there's a lot of investment happening. But given the circumstances you described in Bihar, that doesn't look to be happening either. So how has it accumulated this massive increase in debt as well? You see, this debt is to a large extent because of expenses that you cannot avoid yeah and uh, it's basically for running of the system so to say that uh, uh, the state has indeed uh, uh, got into this situation on the other hand uh, to be fair to the what was very popularly known as sushasan babu's regime there have been Certain areas, you know, for instance, capital expenditure, if you look at that, there was some increase. Uh, there, there was some increase in uh, rural development, roads, electricity and so on. So, part of it is explained by that. Yeah. Uh, but given that its basis of resource mobilization is so limited, you can't do it any other way. No? It has to it has to rely to, uh, to a large extent on that yeah and the options for borrowing also for state governments tend to be limited so you know sort of uh, uh, what ha happened earlier you know, for instance uh, till i think 2007 8 or so you had uh, certain kinds of options which were happened to be there that changed subsequently. All this has obviously cost implications. Yeah? So then that keeps getting added to your debt. Right? So if you are raising debt at higher cost and so on, uh, 
So, we need to explore all these issues. So, as of now, if you look at uh, the debt situation, it is uh, 2,8,000 crores uh, and if you are looking only at public debt, that is 1,65,000 crores in the current financial year. It has increased since 2005-06 by 500 times. Yeah. And if you look at between 2010-11, the increase is 300 times. So, where this borrowed money has been put as uh, uh, you asked, I have been asking the same question. <laughs> as I said, part of it I can see, part of it is invisible is uh, not quite clear, you know, what kind of uh, priorities the state uh, set up for itself. If it was very carefully spent on social sector expenditures and the necessary infrastructure, physical infrastructure, we would have seen, in fact, very decent kind of returns also, right? But why is it that we are not uh, seeing that? Clearly, the answer lies in the fact that the way it was spent uh, in ways which possibly were not productive, which should not have been prioritized and so on. Right, absolutely. And this context, you had mentioned the policies of the centre. Now, one of the major claims of Narendra Modi in his campaign has been that there has been a double engine. The governments of the state and the centre have been in perfect sync and that is the reason for all this development. So, over the past few years, what has been the state of Bihar with respect to the union government? You see, it is indeed the case that uh, barring uh, 18 months or so when uh, JDU decided to be part of the so-called Grand Alliance and was with uh, RJD, Congress and so on, if you take that out, it has had a good equation with the, the center, yeah. Earlier also with the uh, NDA 1 and then subsequently NDA 2 and NDA 3, Modi 1 and Modi 2, right. So, that of course has helped things a bit, but not very much. No, uh, for a variety of reasons, Bihar has not been prioritized by the union government. Right? Go back to the election promises of 2015. None of it was fulfilled. Right? From the overall resource envelope that was talked about to small things. Now, it's amazing that in 2015 you talk of uh, medical college in Darbhanga, in 2020 you talk of a medical college in Darbhanga, <laughs> right? So, it's uh, uh, partly because of uh, uh, certain kind of, uh, I would say, uneasy equation that uh, Nitish Kumar may have had with uh, the center. Two, in center scheme of things, it does not figure, right? To the same extent that, let us say, Uttar Pradesh figures, of course, Gujarat figures and so on. So, that uh, is uh, the primary reason uh, why we have uh, this kind of situation. So, you know, there was uh, a demand of, uh, you know, this special category state and the requirement which would go a long way. Why is that not being honoured? You know, I mean, assurance is given, right? It was never agreed, but assurance, yes. Election time, of course, you can expect that all kinds of assurances are given. But post-election, you know, you have had occasions when it has been said that it would be considered seriously and so on, but uh, no special package. Right? So, I would say that uh, 
in general this relationship between uh, Bihar and the center has not been at the same level in terms of comfort, in terms of synergy and so on, in terms of give and take, which some other states have had, basically BJP ruled states in the last six years. So that's part of the story. The other factor, you know, since you talked of the synergy and so on and so forth, uh, it is uh, indeed the case that uh, there is lot of rhetoric about cooperative federalism, but on ground it is anything but cooperative federalism. In fact, if you look at the economic processes on the ground, basically it is a kind of what you can call competitive federalism. right? So, it is like a race to the bottom and each state trying to sort of do many things. Labor laws are a very good example and the way that kind of drags down a very large section of the population in each state. So, it is like a race to the bottom and so on. In fact, the phrase which I would prefer for this is predatory federalism. I do not even want to call it competitive federalism. Because the union government, the center, unleashes forces and that has been the hallmark of the current prime minister, if you look at his policies, etc. Right? So, at the level of rhetoric, you know, you can talk of anything and everything, but the processes which have been put in motion, once you start analyzing them, you find that we are in a deep hole yeah and that has been the reason how things got messed up right and that is where i mean you have to for instance look at demonetization was any state government taken into confidence right okay you might say that since this was supposed to be a shock and all thing and the state governments could not have been taken into account, etc. Think of lockdown. Yeah, it was a huge sort of decision which the states had to implement. You know, and states not only had to implement, but they also had to be responsible for a whole range of policies that are required to try and ease the pain of this lockdown. You leave all that to the states without taking them into confidence. If you think of GST and the way it has been implemented and you know states uh, have been crying hoarse, we see what was uh, happening in the last uh, roughly seven, eight months. Yeah, uh, The uh, payments which were due for the previous year, right? that were paid only after April. So, this whole sort of uh, talk of cooperative federalism and synergy between centre and states, to my mind, is completely misplaced. And finally, Professor, one last question. So, uh, we talked about the government and its various failings. Now, the opposition has a very ambitious agenda. They are promising a huge number of jobs. They are promising, of course, in a completely new model of development. How are they, what are the possibilities for financing this if they do come to power? For a state like Bihar, which is very limited in terms of mobilization of resources, the challenges will continue to be huge. Because the architecture of resource mobilization in the country has changed for the worse. And uh, there, as I said, GST played a terrible role. Right? In fact, the 10th Finance Commission had brought many areas in terms of you know, raising resources, etc., within the ambit of state governments. What uh, 
happened yeah, uh, with the GST was a real retrogression. Right? So, we need to keep that in mind. Okay? So, broadly you sort of uh, are very constrained, very challenged, right? but uh, you know if we look at uh, the choices which uh, the state government has, any state government, of course one is that you say listen FRBM is something which uh, is uh, hurting us quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So, what has been done for instance in the context of the COVID uh, pandemic, there was some rethink on that, okay, that instead of three you can go up to five and you know the provisions were outlined and so on. Again conditionalities, I mean the union government was behaving like as if it's the big brother and the you know <laughs> like a landlord and so on. But I would argue that for many states which are lower down the development ladder. Now, there is nothing wrong in saying, okay, you can choose to have this kind of arrangement so that, you know, your resource kitty can be uh, strengthened. Right? But that is a huge political decision, whether that happens or not, you know, is, is uh, difficult to say and one would be right in being pessimistic about it given the overall neoliberal climate etc. Right? Um, borrowing, so you know you have to think of how to use your borrowed resources more judiciously. There could be some improvements there in terms of prioritizing, so you know, whether it is uh, your social sectors or basic infrastructure. Uh, these could be pushed. You know. So, for instance, good quality education not only creates good quality education, but it also creates huge employment, right? So, you have a large number of uh, uh, young people, train them properly and so on. Why is that not being prioritized? Okay, so these things can be done. Then you have and uh, I am being very careful when I propose this. The option which had been foregone, which was given up in 2016, and uh, I am thinking of alcohol, right? What is this utterly, uh, shall I say, retrogressive uh, moralism uh, which uh, you want to impose on uh, the state at large? So, can we think of taking care of that? Can we ask and this only Bihar cannot do as part of uh, many other states insist on if you are not giving us anything else at least give us a share in CES which is our right. I mean why is it that this CES becomes the right of the union government? So these will have to be very important points of negotiation right? and uh, any uh, progressive trajectory is uh, to my mind almost impossible without uh, some hard contestation, some uh, difficult choices. So, it would have to be a mixture of all that. And that to Bihar would not be able to do it alone, it has no, to be a… No, no, certainly not. So, but Bihar certainly can go back on its uh, decision on prohibition, yeah. And uh, you know, I, I talk, talk to anyone from Bihar, yeah. And it has become possibly one of the biggest uh, illegal industries in that state. Now, do we want that, right? If you want to enforce it, then that is a kind of expenditure which itself is a extremely skewed kind of option, no? Yeah. Instead of having teachers, you want to have maybe five inspectors every village. Is that what we want to do? So, you know, I think possibilities are there. <clears throat> no easy options, sure enough. Yeah, I mean, of course, whatever slack is there in, uh, let's say, resource 
utilization, I'm not talking of mobilization now, that again can be used. But yes, if we can do some of these things, I think uh, it should be possible to move ahead. But uh, the larger challenge is how to get a more progressive kind of uh, federalism in place again. Yeah. To my mind, as I said earlier, you know, this uh, GST was anti-constitution. And of course, it has been adopted by all states. So now you can say that it has been passed. So how can you say this? But the spirit of constitution, I think this was uh, completely against that. You know, very good arguments have been given why, as per the constitution, it was a disaster. And as an economic arrangement, I mean, there is nothing which uh, can be claimed for it, to my mind. You know, it's all rhetoric. So if you want to be in the happy world of Alice in Wonderland, so be it. Okay, but possibilities are there. They have to work much harder. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Praveen. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure talking to you. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.